the Lord, mightiest prophet of the Lord? Amen. Uh, Senior Pastor Gertrude, now, um, I know it is raining a little bit on this other side in Nairobi, but I guess I can come through very clearly live, right? Yes, please, mightiest prophet of the Lord. You are very, very clear, my Lord. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, beloved people, I know that um, just a few hours to Sunday in Australia, it's already Sunday probably, and um, I wanted to talk about this visitation that you see now sweeping across the globe at this hour, the one that has gone viral, the one that has shaken the whole earth, the visitation of God, the Godhead, and the Godhead coming down in one form, in the form of God, the Holy Spirit. It's a mega visitation, it's a historic visitation of all time. We are very much aware that Christ Jesus, the Messiah alone, had been assigned this visitation. And now this generation has seen that this visitation has also come to them. And so it becomes very important to address it, to attend it, because for everything you see that belongs to you, that appertains to this generation, and that's why I felt it would be very important, since tomorrow in all the churches, they will be displaying this visitation of the Godhead. As we all know, the Godhead exists in three persons. In the person of God the Father, in the person of God the Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and in the person of God the Holy Spirit. And this visitation of God that took place in Burungu Stadium all the way back, January 1, 2009, during the night vigils, the night Kesha, the New Year's Eve service, the healing service that took place and people were healed, mighty, mighty healing took place there. And you see that uh, when the Lord led his servant to take testimonies of the blind eyes that had opened, the deaf ears that had opened, and then when he came to this lame person, the young person that was lame, whose, whose, whose leg was physically stretched and extended. A whole column of the leg was formed and created by the Lord. So when the Lord led his servant to take that testimony, and upon that testimony, when the servant of the Lord said, let us give praise to Jesus for what he has done here. And then at the peak of that, a song began, a worship song, Hallelujah, Hosanna. And as, uh, as the, the, the congregation and the meeting began to sing, Hallelujah, Hosanna, then right there was the biggest visitation of our time. Like I said, the visitation that was only assigned to Christ Jesus the Messiah, Christ Jesus the Lord. And uh, then that visitation takes place, that January 1, January 1, the year 2009. And then you see the Lord conceals it from the whole earth, like he has concealed many things about this messenger 
and he conceals it for many years, quite many years, all the way to now, close to 10 years. And then now, when the fullness of time comes, when the appointed moment, the appointed season arrives, then the Lord now unconceals it. The Lord opens it up now, and then it fits within the paradigm, the bigger picture of what is happening right now in the Church of Christ and world over. I thought today I should be able to begin this conversation. It is going to be a non-stop conversation because it's the greatest visitation of our time. And I thought I could start with it today, maybe have a few sessions today to enable the pastors, the senior pastors, the senior bishops, to be able also to begin to engage their churches tomorrow on this most monumental and astronomical visitation of our time. And yesterday I had a meeting with the National Council of Bishops and essentially it was a luncheon to meet with them in the light of the recent developments so that the recent visitations, so that I may just mingle with them, walk in between them, and talk to them, and break the ice, that they may know that he is still standing with us. He is still accessible to us. But I knew very well in our previous conversations that in the light of the monumental developments that have taken place, There would be a distance, there would be fear also from the Council of Bishops to approach. And so yesterday I spent some time just walking among them, between them, talking to them, laughing with them, breaking the barrier with them to let them know that, yes, indeed, we are still the same. And that uh, makes it easier to engage with them and to instruct and to do ministration, and to prepare the church, especially after the monumental events that are taking place now. So in that conversation, I touched a little on what I'm going to handle today, yesterday. I touched a little on what I'm going to handle today here. So again, it is raining on this side, and I think I'm still very clear. Is that true, uh, Gertrude? Yes, please, mightiest prophet of the Lord. You are clear, please, my Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I can begin this uh, important instruction. Now, um, this visitation that is going to be exhibited in the churches for some time, this may be shown in the churches probably for the next two months nonstop, because this is the biggest visitation of our time. This is the peak visitation, and like I said, this is a visitation that was only assigned to God, and let me explain it a little better. The Godhead existing in three persons, in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that this visitation was specifically designed by the Godhead. That the Godhead may use this to be able to demonstrate, to illustrate, to present, to exhibition the great relationship that exists between God the Father and God the Son. and that the Holy Spirit will be the intermediary of that trinity, the triunity of that conversation. So it's a God visitation. It's a visitation assigned to God. 
I know he talks about pouring his spirit into the church. We bless the Lord for this. But now I'm talking about God in bodily form, heaven opening, and God in bodily form, the Godhead, leave heaven and come down. And in, pub, in the public space for people to see. So, so this is a very big thing. It is going to be a non-stop developing story, continuous developing conversation and story that we will engage on again and again and again and again over the time that is ahead of us. Now, I want right away as I begin to open up this conversation to the senior pastors who will be teaching tomorrow. I know most of the bishops are the senior pastors in their churches and the senior bishops. I want to stepwise begin to open up this conversation and I don't know how far we can go tonight. But uh, turn with me the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. So we can reference from there and then build on even as the Lord gives counsel tonight. Before we read Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, I would like to recap to bring your attention. And I saw that this is very important to do, considering the interaction I had with the bishops yesterday, the senior bishops in the council. Yesterday there was a big meeting of the National Council and College of Bishops, but in that interaction with them on this matter, on this visitation, the unveiling of it, then I realized it is very important to recapture for you, to look back and pull back the visitation of the Lord of 2nd of April, the year 2004. And I'm going to describe that. It's a, it's a robust prophecy. It's a very big prophecy, you would say, it was the commissioning statement for he that speaks with you today and the two that stand before the Lord. Now, on that 2nd of April, the year 2004, in that major, major visitation that became a big prophecy that has changed the earth until now, I want to take this particular part when I'm standing right before the throne of God and the throne of God is covered totally with the glory of the Lord and the glory is so huge, so it's covering the throne and the throne is more like a mountain of glory, it's very pure white glory. And in the many conversations that took place there, the moon Happens blood, it is swathed with the red, blood red, and the glory is so holy, yeah, I can hear the hissing sound of holiness. It's a tremendous sight and moment to behold. And then, after that, I have a conversation with John the Baptist. I know in the earlier narrative I've described how he walked in a triangle, he walked this way, come this way, when he came from the throne, the throne from the glory. And then after this conversation, there is the part that deals with Israel when the voice of the Lord said, come, let me show you what is about to happen to the earth. Then that is where I got from the prophecy by 2004. gave the prophecy of Benjamin Netanyahu 1, Benjamin Netanyahu 2, the right-wing government that will be formed in Israel, the anxiety that will take place in uh, all the global capitals and so forth. And the Lord takes me all across the globe. He takes me over Israel. I see the changes of leadership in Jerusalem. And all these prophecies I gave way back in the year 2004, and you see materialized until now Benjamin Netanyahu is the Israeli prime minister. In other words, the prophecy that enthroned Benjamin Netanyahu. In other words, the authority and the command and the words that brought his leadership, the current leadership, into being. 
very powerful situation, beloved people. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, when the conversation with John the Baptist took place, then John the Baptist walks towards him that speaks to him and dissolves in him and disappears inside him, inside me. And you remember from that point on, I began to go all over the earth, prepare the way, announcing to the mountains, repent, prepare the way, the Messiah is coming, repent, announcing to the oceans, to the rivers and to the lakes, announcing to the seas and the springs, to the trees and the herbs and the leaves and the, and the grass, to the rocks, announcing to mankind, Announcing to creation, to the planets, announcing to all, including the angels in heaven, saying, listen to me, the earth, listen to me, the nations of the earth, listen to me, the heavenly hosts, the Messiah is coming. This commissioning statement that uh, got this very, very powerful ministry of heaven to roll out, until this day, and of course set forth very big events like the Israeli leadership current. So, John the Baptist walks towards me and dissolves in me and disappears in me. So that conversation. Yesterday I realized it would be important to reflect on that conversation as I handled this visitation. Well, having said so, having taken you back to 2nd of April, the year 2004, I think it is prudent now to read the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And this is what he says. You could begin from verse 13. 13, he says, Then come at Jesus, this is King James, Then come at Jesus, from Galilee to Jordan and to John to be baptized. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized by thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered, Jesus answering said unto John, unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. That is verse 15. Verse 16, he says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up. Remember the word is up, came up, went up, meaning he had gone totally down into the water. It was complete immersion. Went up straight out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Verse 17, he says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That is King James. Let us see what Amplified says. Then Jesus came from Galil to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And he goes on to say, beloved people, verse 14, but John protested seriously, strenuously, but John protested strenuously, having in mind 
to prevent him sin. It is I who have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Verse 15. But Jesus replied to him, Permit it just now, for this is the fitting way for both of us to fulfill all righteousness. That is, to perform completely whatever is right. Then he permitted him. Verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up at once, up at once again, from down, from under the water, down up at once, meaning complete immersion. He went up at once out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he, John, saw the Spirit, because now here in Amplified he's saying, he, John, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. He is alighting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, my beloved Son, in whom I delight. So, precious people, this is very powerful. That is amplified. And the New American Standard says, Then Jesus arrived from Galil at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Verse 15. But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Verse 16, he says on, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately. Again, he says, came up, meaning he was down in water, down into the water, completely measured, came up. So you see the definition of the doctrine of baptism right here. He says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Verse 17 says, And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The NIV says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? In other words, it is I that need to be baptized by you. I need you to baptize me. Why are you coming to me then? Verse 15, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Again, up out. Meaning he was down into the water. Complete immersion. Definition. The definition of baptism being laid clear here. The foundation of Christianity being laid here. And a voice, again, he said, and he saw, and he said, heaven, heaven opened, and he saw, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. 
And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So a very powerful, beloved people. I've read only four versions here. And you see very clearly that uh, as we begin to discuss this visitation of the Godhead, Jehovah, Jehovah Yahweh is his name, descending from heaven in that visitation of January 1, 2009, and lighting on his servant, lighting on me in the public space, in the open, in this age, as we begin to address this conversation, this visitation, this conversation between heaven and earth, this visitation of the Godhead, we refer back. You see that I take you back to the same visitation and how the same visitation was consigned, was consigned to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that is exactly where the message is going to come from. Because you see now, in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, I mean, from 13 down to 17, I've read. But you see very clearly that this reference scripture spells out this visitation. That when John the Baptist walked in that vision before the throne room of God and dissolved in me, on that 2nd of April, the year 2004, and it appeared in me here. You see that when Christ came to be baptized at the Jordan, then now, John says, no, I cannot baptize you. I actually need you to baptize me. I need to be baptized by you. Because the higher, the greater baptizes the lower. So he said, no, it is you who need to baptize me. It is incredible, beloved people. These are the mysteries of God. The unexplainable mysteries of Jehovah. That made Jesus say, whom did you come to see? John. You came to see a prophet? Then he said, one greater than a prophet. Now you can see the kind of duty and task assignment that was laid before him at that time. And I want to open up this today, beloved people, in a very, very special way for you. That you may understand clearly what the Lord is saying in this visitation. I know most people now know they understand, but I want to bring it from Scripture. That all people be at the same level, that all churches may teach this tomorrow. That all churches, all sheep, all congregations may be enlightened as to the hour and the time. Now, this is so powerful because you now see that when John baptizes Jesus, and upon Christ Jesus, the Messiah, my Lord, coming up out, up out, meaning he was in complete immersion, up out of the water, then the heavens opened, heaven opened, and when heaven opened, then God the Father now, pronounces himself unto the Son, unto the events, unto the Messiah, unto the mission. And he says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. King James. Amplify says, This is my beloved Son, so you can see the belovedness, in whom I delight. NIV says, This is my son, whom I love, 
and with him I am well pleased. Very powerful, beloved people. And so, there is an underlying message here which is so powerful because at that time, the whole world, Israel, and by extension, the whole earth, was waiting for the Messiah. All the nations were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. I know in some very interesting way, it is almost similar to where we are at right now. I'm going to explain. And I've talked about in terms of the coming of the Messiah. Then I will explain in terms of he that speaks with you also. But the entire earth and Israel were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And they wanted to know who is the Messiah? Who would be the Messiah? What would he look like? How would we know for that this is he? Christ the Messiah. The Lord Christ. The Savior. The Redeemer. And so, it was in that anticipation, in that situation of anticipation, great expectation that finally the Messiah appeared and you see very clearly here that John the Baptist John the Baptist was tasked was commissioned by the Lord was duty bound by God was sent by God was tasked with the duty of identifying the Messiah for the world, for the universe, for the nations, and for the angels in heaven. The role and the duty of John the Baptist here, the task, was to identify the Messiah and commission him off in his office as Messiah. Publicly before the world, that the world may now know that this is he, the Messiah. This is the Lord Christ. So that was the situation in a nutshell, beloved people. And so now I want to open it up for you a little bit, precious people. Turn with me then. To the book of John chapter 1, verses 31 to 34. John chapter 1, and I said we'll have this in segments. I'll take a break and then come back. But John chapter 1, maybe we're going to take some two breaks in between. But ensure that the message is fully delivered to the church. Again, John chapter 1. Verses 29, we could start from 29, essentially I wanted 32 to 34, but let's begin from 31 or even 29. And he says this in 29, I'm reading NIV. He says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. And said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let me explain this a little bit. Before Jesus is identified, the Lord speaks with John in a dream at night. And the Lord makes John know that tomorrow the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, the Son of the living God, the Lord Christ, is going to come to you 
I am going to send you to you tomorrow. So John is already aware that as he goes to work on his mission, the Messiah would come to him on that day. And that's why in verse 29, he says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Because he knew already that he would come. And when he comes, the Lord God had made John know who he is, what he looks like. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Very powerful, beloved people. And in, uh, in King James, he says, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So John already knows him from the revelation of God the Father. The Godhead has already revealed to him in dream, as you know, the way the Lord operates with his prophets. And then the Messiah comes. And you can be sure the Messiah too, because the, the scriptures, the prophecy says the Messiah would be a prophet. So you can be sure the Messiah too has been revealed to that he was going to John. Verse 30, beloved people, John chapter 1. He says, This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Hallelujah. I myself, now verse 31 was my intended target on. He says, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel and of course by extension to the universe, to the earth, to the world. So John is saying very clearly here now that I did not know him. I did not know him. But the reason the Lord sent me, the reason the Lord has sent me to baptize with water, the one that sent me to baptize with water, the reason he sent me to baptize with water was that in the process of baptizing people, I may encounter the Messiah and reveal him to the world, reveal him to Israel. Hallelujah. You now see the mission of John. You see the reason of baptism, beloved people. The reason John baptized. He says, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel that as I baptize people, I will encounter him and then reveal him to Israel and of course to humanity. How powerful the mission. So that was the mission of baptism. That was the purpose of the baptism of water that John was sent to bring. And he goes further on to say in verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. 
I would not have known. John repeats now. He repeats. He makes the emphasizes that he would not have known him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with fire with the Holy Spirit. Then look at the way John pens off. John is penning off now. Look at the way the ministry of John is ending right away after identifying him. Look at this now. Verse 34. I have sinned and I testify that this is Christ the Son of the living God. John now identifies him to the world. Identifies him to Israel. And the ministry of John ends right there. How powerful. And the baptism of John, the baptism of John ends right there. The baptism of water. Again, reading from King James Verse 34, he says, verse 34, verse, let's start from verse 33. He says, I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is which is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And John ends off by saying, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. In other words, this is the Messiah. In other words, this is the Christ. How powerful, beloved people. So you see very clearly here that John is sent to baptize. Baptize with water. And as I baptized with water, the purpose was that I may be able to identify him and reveal him to the world. And in that process of identification, now God the Father sends the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, the Godhead comes down as God the Holy Spirit. Jehovah comes down as a dove. Luke chapter 3, verses 21 to 22. Luke chapter 3, that you may understand better, beloved people. Luke chapter 3, verses 21. All the way to 22 and 23. Probably 22 is suffice. He says, Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form. That is the biggest thing you want to catch there. If I were you, I would underline that. I would mark that. In bodily form. In bodily form. Like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son. Whom 
I love. With you, I am well pleased. Very powerful, beloved people. Now, I have brought you to a place where now you are beginning to understand the gravity of this visitation when God, the Godhead, sends, he comes down. He comes down in the form of God, the Holy Spirit. And he's coming at the baptism place, at the exact location of the Jordan River, where baptism is taking place. And he's coming on one mission, to identify Christ Jesus, the Messiah to the world. The world has been waiting. In great anticipation, great expectation that the Messiah would come, that the Christ would come, but the hour would have to unveil. The hour would have to arise when finally whoever is walking among us here and is that Messiah, he would have to be identified to humanity, to the nation, to the generation. And that identification, beloved people, you can now see the gravity is born. That Jehovah Yahweh, the Godhead himself, had to come down and identify him for mankind, that they may get it right, that this is your Savior. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. Hallelujah. Very powerful. I'm using the visitation that came unto Christ the Messiah in order to deliver to you a very important message on the visitation of January 1, the year 2009, when the same God descended, Jehovah Yahweh, the Godhead, descended down in body form and lighted on me and settled on me and then left. I am first handling the same visitation of Christ Jesus the Messiah and I'm bringing to you the gravity of heaven, the gravity of heaven having to come down. The Godhead himself happy to come down to identify him to all humanity that this is the one you have been waiting for. Hallelujah. So now, in the book of Luke chapter 3, you see that in bodily form, one of the members, one of the persons of the triune God, the Trinity of God, the person of God the Father, the person of God the Son, and the person of God the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the persons of Jehovah, Jehovah now comes down as the person of God the Holy Spirit in order to come and identify the Messiah, God the Son, to this generation, to the entire earth, all the nations, to all the universe, to all the generations, to the entire heaven, to identify himself, this is the Messiah. Don't look anymore, in other words. This is he. And so you see the gravity that brings God from heaven. Heaven opens and God descends down in bodily form, bodily form, to come and identify to men, to avoid confusion, and identify to him that this is the Christ, this is the Messiah. Hallelujah. And Luke says, in bodily form, and I just want to lay this to you, beloved people, that this visitation is monumental. I am still handling Christ. 
how he visited Christ to identify him to the whole earth and heaven, to all the universe and all the heavenly hosts. Why? Because they too are all watching. In fact, they come down. They come down in a big entourage. This is Jehovah God coming down. So the entire heavenly hosts and the many, many, many trumpet men, this visitation is very big at the Jordan River. It is too big. The advanced teams are coming. The heavenly angels, the archangels, the heavenly hosts, the trumpet men, everybody is coming down. God is coming down. It is a very big visitation, beloved people, more than meets the eye here. On one mission, to identify the Messiah to all the nations, to all creation, to all heaven. And you see that it is on this identification when now John says, This is him. I have seen him and I bear testimony. I bear witness that this is the Messiah. You see that that now, on that day, that is the next segment I'm going to cover, that became a very powerful commissioning statement. That now commissioned the Messiah after the Holy Spirit descended, now commissioned him into the office of the Messiah. So he can begin doing the duty of the Messiah. And begin to prepare to go to the cross. How powerful, beloved people. And we see that it is this commissioning now that gave Christ the Messiah the authority you see in Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 6 when there was a big distress in the kingdom of God Almighty in heaven. A big unbelievable distress and stood in heaven in Revelation chapter 5 the scroll that the father holds in his hand there was a tremendous distress and they were asking who who is it that is going to take the scroll and break the seals of the scroll that God the father was holding on his right hand. And remember, I have seen that scroll. I have seen the scroll of God in heaven, beloved people. And you see in Revelation chapter 5, the reason now the Messiah got the authority, got the power and authority to be able to operate in that office, you see, that authority you see wielded in Revelation chapter 5 and 6 was because of this commission here by God, the Godhead at the baptism when John baptized him. And John testified and said, this is him. It is that commissioning that gave Christ the Messiah the power you see, him, the authority you see him wielding in Revelation chapter 5. So, I read the book of Revelation, chapter 5, from verse 1. He says, When I saw, sorry, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Again, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming, Who is worthy? Proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? 
but no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And we know that the scroll has the writings of the blueprint for the redemption of man. The blueprint for the salvation of man. So it has to be opened for the prophetic timeline to begin to count down and man be delivered into eternity. The redemption of the church. He said, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. And we know that the opening of the scroll and the breaking of the seals is what defines the zero countdown, the prophetic timeline to the return of the Messiah, to the entry of the church, to the end of time. So somebody has to open it, has to break the seals. Has to read it. Verse 5, Revelation chapter 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lamb of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the right, right David, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. How powerful, beloved people. And I say, it is this admission of Christ Jesus at the Jordan River after baptizing, after being baptized by John the Baptist, and the Godhead coming and identifying him. And John now, admitting him in the verse 34 of John chapter 1, saying that, I have seen, I bear testimony, this is your Messiah. It is that admission and commissioning of the Messiah into the office of the Messiah to do the duty of the Messiah to deliver men on the cross that gives him power in Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 6 to now break the seals. Then he says, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has triumphed and is able to open the scroll and break its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Look at that, beloved people. Now he brings in the lamb Slain, meaning that admission, that commissioning of the Messiah, of Christ Jesus, by John the Baptist, into the office of the Messiah, and endorsed by God, the Godhead, God coming in the form of a dove, in the form of God the Holy Spirit, Jehovah coming down as God the Holy Spirit, and endorsing him publicly, that commissioning of the Messiah into the office, of the Messiah at the Jordan River upon baptism is what gave him power to now be this, do this in chapter 5, Revelation 5. How powerful. Because now you see very clearly that after the elders are proclaimed in heaven that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David and Israel, then he saw him slain. He saw him standing there at the center as if he had been slain and blood flowed. I have seen that. I saw that vision on the 2nd of April. When you follow the whole narrative, you'll see where I say it. Now the Lord opened my eyes and I saw inside the throne of God. And I saw a glorious throne. And I saw the Messiah sitting on the 
pure white glorious throne and I saw that he had been slain and was bleeding on his glory like this from the neck. There is so much more in that prophecy of 2nd of April 2004 beloved people. Now you see that identification, that commissioning of the Messiah, Christ Jesus as the Messiah into the office of the Messiah allowed him to go to the cross finish the job, and of course I'll touch a little bit on the transfiguration, where the two stood before him again there, on the same commissioning, that he may go finish the job, but sent him to the cross and gave him authority now to break the seals for the redemption of man. The blueprint for the salvation of the nations, of mankind, and you see down there, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open his seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe, every language, and every people, a nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. How powerful, beloved people. This event 